Hello everybody and welcome to VFX Bytes Diving Into Deep Part 1 Surface Level Introduction. I would like to uh, open up the VFX Byte series just for once for those of you that are on my regular channel just through my YouTube and are not Patreons. Uh, VFX Bytes is basically a whole uh, group of uh, uh, training that I have specific to my Patreon providers and so forth. If you'd like to join in with this, the exclusive content, you can jump over to my Patreon at www.patreon.com slash VFX for film. And I have all these awesome posts, uh, you know, uh, awesome stuff coming, vignettes, all types of fun stuff here. And uh, I also have roundtable discussions, and I have a tier here, uh, but it's $9. This is basically a tip. But with the $9, you get access to the VFX Bytes and the VFX Bytes actual nuke files and nuke uh, files such as what I have here, which is a bunch of rendered clouds out of Houdini that are rendered in deep data. Now, just for this one circumstance, I'm giving you guys a, pr a free preview of the uh, nuke Bytes series uh, with this one right here, which will give us a good introduction into nuke, uh, deep compositing. And I hope to go even further into more production level stuff, but just to have a basic understanding of what is this. Uh, so again, please support my Patreon. Uh, every bit helps, even if it's a dollar. And again, if you do have Patreon, you can get access to the actual downloadable nuke file and the nuke uh, folders, and they all line up. You just download the folder and so forth. So let's talk about what we're going to discuss today. We're going to discuss today um, the nodes that are atypical inside of uh, nuke. Uh, so here you can see these are the nuke deep nodes here, and then everything in this red zone is actually plugins or uh, Nukepedia uh, tool sets. Now, if you were to load this without these uh, files, or if you just get the free version uh, or the demo version of PG Boca, you're basically just going to have this error out. Uh, my basic um, thing to tell you is to go ahead and look at my previous video I just made before this which has to do with coming in here and uh, installing NukeBridge and for five dollars a month you can actually use it to install all the plugins that are on Nukepedia including the plugins that we use here and unless you have those plugins this information down here will not work so you can either manually install them by taking the gizmos and putting them in your gizmo file uh, folder and then going to all plugins update um, or you can do it the really nice and easy and luxurious way here by jumping over to the Nukepedia site and actually uh, paying five dollars for the month and actually installing this nuke bridge which is definitely going to help you out tremendously okay so with that said let's go ahead and jump in and kind of talk about uh, nuke uh, what what is uh, the deep compositing again usually you'll see these nodes over here in deep so deep is commonly used at big post-production houses. I know we were talking to uh, Richard and uh, how he, when he was at Digital Domain, he was working in deep. A lot of places like Weta Digital, they use deep. Um, usually they use deep for the real robust work of holdouts as well as if they're dealing with multiple populace of CG characters and need to pop out the animation of one character really quickly. Think of it like Planet of the Apes where you have a thousand apes running around. Um, because you have all these pieces, you don't have to composite based on A over B uh, in sort of a stacked method. Everything is based on deep depth, uh, which has a backward and forward depth. So it's not just like a depth, depth, uh, depth read where you actually just see uh, a distance of camera per pixel, but if the pixel in front of it is semi-transparent, any pixel value that's behind it, such as in this case clouds, will actually read as another sort of point in information. So there could be multiple layers of information in here depending on the transparency of the object. In this case this color wheel is you know not transparent, but this cloud is. So if the pixel in the foreground is transparent just by the ever so slightest it'll actually read the pixel data of the next pixel behind it and basically create a point cloud. Hence you can get these really cool effects where you can stick uh, you know, green screen characters into clouds and have the clouds go by you know, and, and stick buildings within clouds. And, and these renders, of course, you can do uh, through Arnold Houdini. I'm going to go into that in the future episodes, how you can render deep data uh, and actually incorporate it into nuke compositing. 
So I have this really nice kind of workflow that should be pretty easy for you to understand to kind of head straight through uh, the workflow here. So let's start with the typical deep renders here. So that if you want to take a look at deep information, usually when you render it out of a, an application, like in this case I used Houdini, and um, you're going to get a combination of two separate inputs here. Usually your AOV passes and so forth will be uh, sticking into an EXR uh, normal file, and the other one will be a deep EXR. Now this deep EXR, you can see that I have the folder structure set up here, so it's based on the root folder, so you just got to drop the folder uh, when you get it. Um, if you are a Patreon subscriber, um, you just load up this nuke file, which is diving into deep one, and it should load up everything accordingly. You don't have to repath any of this stuff. So the deep data is a lot heavier than most files. The sizes are very, uh, the sizes are a lot bigger. That's why major big studios are the ones that really can only handle this amount of data information. In this case, you're only getting one still image. Uh, you're actually getting uh, two separate sets. Usually a set is usually the RGB information, which if I put my uh, viewer to this here, you can see that I have the information for the alpha. I have the depth information. I have the normal information, position information. Looks like I didn't render, though. <laughs> we won't be using any of that. So anyway, it's all there and it's uh, really cool. So you can layer this stuff up. They use this a lot in this process in creating a lot of fog and uh, really awesome um, sort of like sculpting atmospherics inside of Blade Runner 2049. And there's a good video online that kind of talks about how much they enjoyed using Deep um, over at their studio. I forgot which studio it was. I think it was Rodeo Effects. I could be wrong. So anyway, uh, with that said, uh, the deep information again does not hold any information. Um, it, it does. It can hold information such as deep, as you see here. So if I go ahead and hold on, just click on deep, you can see the data that's in here. And if I were to sort of gamma down, I guess you're not going to see it. It's basically a value of R and G. If you guys have never seen a color wheel before, let me go ahead and throw a color wheel down. Color wheel uh, consists of a, the red and the green channel. Basically, is the deep data. And that has to do with the backwards and forwards, uh, back and front uh, basic uh, sampling. And then this color yellow is the combination too. That's why this information is coming off as yellow. If you sample the data value, you can see the values are not only reading red, green, and blue, but you're reading red at 428 and then value of 505 for the green. So you can see there's definitely information in here uh, just to be aware of. So again, it's just... That's basically where the deep, uh, the deep goods are. Okay, so this other pass is just the regular RGB pass that usually gets exported out. And this, again, is a little bit lighter and has all your, uh, you know, different AOVs or arbitrary output variables. So what you usually do with this is you're going to usually combine these two with the deep recolor. And the reason being is you might want to do some manipulation of the image uh, in here using the nodes that are inside of Maya. You can see that if I try doing something such as a right node like this, and I try to connecting to the deep node, it's not going to work. Inside of uh, Nuke, you usually have a specific design that tells you that certain nodes are incompatible with other nodes, such as anything square is usually going to be uh, something that is, um, in essence, a 2D node. And then if you have a C node, or any 3D nodes such as a material node or apply material, you'll see the circular pattern uh, basically uh, basically says that it's a 3D node. So you got 3D nodes, 2D nodes, and the deep node has this sort of italicized and half circle, almost like 2.5D is what the icon is kind of trying to tell you. So here you can see the deep read node, and then you have this thing called the deep read color. So this allows you to do manipulations with your color information here. Uh, that you can use all types of nodes in here that you would never usually not get um, anywhere else, such for instance hue correct. I could stick that in here. I can come into the uh, properties here. I can take the blue channel. I can knock certain things up and down. Made some changes. 
And because of that, now I can basically format this in. It's almost like formatting uh, using a copy node to reformat your alpha node, except you're basically feeding the RGB values back into the re uh, deep color node. So the deep recolor basically can take a RGB information that's from the 2D realm and bring it in and map it as the RGB. And then the deep data is sort of like the deep alpha information. It's really not an alpha information. So it just allows you to do whatever you want to do manipulating. Now, of course, it's very dangerous to come in here and start doing something like a grid warp to this at this stage because it's going to offset the deep data, which will be a little bit weird. So again, just be aware that uh, as far as the silhouette of your object, in this case we have an alpha object, you'll see that it, you don't want to get too goofy with it. A lot of color correction work you can do, maybe blur it. You know, but this is stuff that you can do. So let's go ahead and take a look at this node. So you can see that it's the deep recolor, and then you also have uh, your options for a bounding box. Then you have this thing called deep color correction. As of right now, a lot of the nodes that you're used to using, such as hue correct and all types of crazy things, sharpening, you really don't have access to that in the deep world. Once you're in deep, and at this point we are in the deep dimension, um, you cannot use all of the nodes that you're atypically using, so you couldn't put a sharpen in here or anything like that. It's not going to work. So for instance, I'll just show you. I'll just take a sharpen node, try to shove it in there, it ain't going to work. So there's a couple options here, and again, you can see the library is rather small for this, and that's because this data is sort of like in a three-dimensional floating format, which is a bit weird. Uh, so it's not something you can just throw any filter on. So the deep color correct is really cool. It's basically a color correction node, but it's working within deep. So you can see here that we have the ability to do saturation. So I'll put my viewer to this right here. And we can mess with the shadow information. Yeah, stuff like that. If I can, yeah, just start moving bars, right? <clears throat> and then, of course, it has a mask, which um, if you come in here, you can see I can plug in a roto node and go like that. And let's see if that does it. Oops, that's a deep transform. Oh, my mistake. Uh, that's right. Deep color correction doesn't really have... Uh, there is a, there's a masking here, but it's, again, based on um, the actual Z-map information here. So you got to... It's the distance and so forth. So you can't really do that. Uh, I'm just looking at transform, sorry. But deep color correction is an overall color correction. If I really do, did want to do a color correction process up here... Um, I can actually just take this information, go back, and I'll right-click and say Reset Knobs to Default. So now we're back. And that's why, again, while I was describing back here, you can go ahead and put, you know, a gray note in and put a roto in there. And now you can take this at a two-dimensional level and color correct this accordingly. So again, I'll take the gain down on this side here. Then it gets formatted, and now we're in deep. So once we're in deep, we're in deep, right? Sort of like the submarine going down. We're no longer on the surface level here. We're working in this uh, blue sort of uh, underwater land, so to speak. Okay, so the deep transform node is rather interesting. Um, again, the thing about deep you got to understand is deep is not something where I can physically take this image and scale it up. I could do that via a reformat node, uh, which can be a little bit interesting. Like, for instance, actually not, not a reformat node, but a deep reformat node. So if you see, we have a deep reformat node. And I can actually start taking this and scaling it up. So you can see I could take this and put this to uh, a specific scale. And I could scale it up like four or something like that. You see what's happening there? I'll just take a look here. You can see, do you see anything happening here in regards to the size as in our aspect ratio? It's not changing. And that's the one thing I, I want to kind of tell you guys about when you're working in this format. If you really want to take some an object and scale it up, you have to take a reformat node, scale it up, and then uh, re-bring it into a file. Uh, but it's still going to be wonky. You're never really going to scale this thing up, okay? You're going to have to either re-render it inside of Houdini, and that's it. The deep transform is rather interesting. The deep transform is a physical moving around in three-dimensional space. So again, like I said before, when you're working in deep, you're not dealing with A over B and then B over C and so forth. You're not dealing with stacked 
issues are dealing with objects in three-dimensional space based on their three-dimensional positions based on their deep data. So if I go to this tool called Deep Samples, if I go ahead and just put my viewer to it here, you will see that there's this little thing at the bottom here, position. I'm going to go ahead and pull that over here. And we're starting to read deep information here. Commonly in depth pass, you're only going to get one depth information per pixel here. But in this case, we're getting a deep front and back, and we're getting samples one, two, three, four, five layers deep. So that's how deep is. It's getting deep. In other words, right here, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. You're talking about a front distance and a back distance. You got your typical RGB value and your alpha value, but this is telling me that there's information here that goes beyond just what is front-facing camera. It's actually, if the front uh, actual pixels are transparent, it knows of the ones that, fur that are further back. This allows for a very interesting uh, volumetric compositing technique of, you know, merging clouds together. Um, just really cool semi-transparent uh, workflows that you really can't get away with without having nasty edges in the traditional 2D sense. To really show off uh, what this looks like, um, we're going to move over here. I'm going to talk about the deep to points to see this in its three-dimensional uh, reality. So in this case, I only have two nodes here. Uh, I've put my viewer to this one. This is 36. This is one specific interesting cloud I rendered. And here's another one uh, right here. What's interesting is this one is actually 1280 by 720. And this one was actually rendered 1920 by 1080. See that? This one's 1920 by 1080. This one is 1280 by 720. I did that for a reason because I want to show you guys how different sizes, when they get merged together, can get interesting. Now, the deep the deep merge has a couple options here. You can either choose holdout or combine. So in this case, it's already set to holdout. So let me go ahead and just put my viewer to it here. So you can see it's set to holdout, and that's this right here. You can add combine or holdout. Combine will actually add the two pieces together. And then I'm going to use this deep to points, which is going to give me a render in three dimensions in the 3D space with the camera that I actually used inside of um, Houdini. Now in Houdini, I was using just an atypical, uh, in this case, like a 30, I think it was like 30 millimeter lens or whatever. So you can just, you know, it's just basically, and you just make a regular camera and set it to whatever focal length you actually had inside the 3D package. But you can see if I just plug this information, the camera information, the deep information, I put my viewer to it, and now you can see I'm actually in 3D mode, which is really cool. You can see those two different elements that go beyond a depth pass, because a depth pass is not going to have data that is... You can see there's there's the data that's here in a depth pass wouldn't exist, because you're, you're kind of looking straight on. You can see there's multiple layers of information here. Depth pass would only create sort of like a um, concave kind of bowl from this direction. There wouldn't be data sitting back here. And that's the beauty of deep is because it has all this layers of depth information in here. So now you can see the two different cloud informations and now we can start playing around with uh, such things as deep transform. So for instance I can make a deep transform here for one of these guys, put it in, and I can move this in different directions. Now there's a heavy distance between here and here. How do I know that? Well, if I go back to this previous example, um, actually, you know what, let's just let's add a deep, sorry, come over here and add a deep sample node again, and I'll plug that in. You can see if I grab the sample again, this little dot down here, you can see the distances. This is 572 units from camera, and over here it's 519. So I know it's roughly 500 units away from the camera itself, roughly, you know, 500 units in distance. So what I'm going to do is come over here, look at my viewer here, and I can, I know that I'm going to have to use pretty big numbers to move this around. So for instance, if I put this to 200, I'm moving in the Z direction back. See that? It's actually been pushed back. I can actually take this and just grab a hold of uh, this with my middle mouse scroll wheel. And you can see I'm moving it in direction. Keep in mind, as you are moving this in 
the space here, let me just show you. So I move this back to camera, right? So I'm just going to go ahead and just, whoops. Can't go with negative space. There you go. But you see how it's actually growing in size? The scale of the object is not changing. It's just moving in depth distance from camera. It, the image never changes. To prove that to you, I'm going to go back to the merge node and just show you. As I start to uh, take this, I'm just going to move this down here for you. You can see as I start to take this and put this through, you can see it's melding within to, in the clouds. This is where you can actually build cloud formations like they did inside of uh, the uh, movie uh, Blade Runner 2049. You can see I'm moving in front of the cloud, behind the cloud. Now I can use the Y direction and I could start pushing into the cloud. You can see I'm basically kind of pressed into the cloud and then I can move, take this information back and you'll see that we're going to start moving. There we go. So we can have a cloud sitting within a cloud, which is really cool. And of course, I got this in the other direction. But again, look at that cloud. That cloud is not changing in scale when I take the Z and move it back. It is properly in 3D space, pushing into and melding into the cloud itself. But the distance itself, it's not getting smaller scale-wise in the two-dimensional reality here. So you can see if I pull this back, it starts to meld into that background. So that's one thing you got to understand about this. It gets, gets kind of funky. Um, there's a one little way I figured out how to actually scale these clouds up and down, and that's just by reformatting their sizes um, and then merging them in with a deep merge node. So again, you could see the, the absolute awesome possibilities of what we can do here uh, with this. And of course, this has a mask input as well. All right, so let's talk about the deep reformat node. So if I put this to this merge here, to this layout, you can see that if I take this deep reformat and turn it off, the scale of this actual cloud is actually small. So if I wanted to scale this up uh, even larger, I can cheat a little bit by taking the deep reformat and scaling it up. In fact, I can go even crazier here and put this to a scale and change up the scale itself. So now it's a huge cloud. If I want to get a huge uh, cumulonimbus cloud, if I recall from the movie Up, it's always hard to pronounce that. You can see I can start to build up the scale a little bit. So that's a great way of kind of fiddling around and then finally merging it in here. So you can see I can do the merge and so forth. And, and there you go. If you want to see what it looks like, you can go to the Deep to Points node here. And we can go ahead and just take a look at the scale of which everything's getting kind of crazy here. Um, so yeah, it's pretty neat. Uh, the deep right node, so I'm just going straight from my deep merge node to my deep right node. And you can usually come in here and write out an EXR sequence. Usually you would render this as an EXR. Uh, there's a null in a CDF format, but usually just an EXR will actually uh, export out. So if you wanted to build a specific combination of clouds and export that out, you have the option. Uh, do keep in mind that you can see the bounding box is actually carrying some information here. And you can get into using the reformat node, such as, I'll just go ahead and put a deep reformat node. And get that in there. So there's the deep reformat node. You can see if I click that, it actually has clipped the data in here, so if I were to come in here with a transform node or a deep transform node and throw that in there and start to move that data, let's see, in the X direction. And you can see it's repeating the last pixel here, which in that case, of course, your re deep reformat node, you want to definitely turn on black outside. And you can see you also have this preserved bounding box for some, some reason, I'm not sure what. I think it's just a deep transform node here. I'm not seeing any option here to uh, keep the black background, but you're getting the getting the gist of it. Let me go ahead and delete this. All right, so the deep expression node, what's that all about? Well, again, if you've done any color correction work or green screen key work, or you have certain things you want to knock out, in this case, I'm taking the max values of uh, whatever red, green, and blue is, and filtering it to the red, green, and blue channel. This scripting is usually used to deal with uh, getting luminance information for green screen work. So if you look at my tutorial on 
uh, keying, uh, you should be okay with that. So there's, there's expression work uh, that you can use if you wish. There's also this thing called the deep crop node. So let me go ahead and just show you what that is. So the deep crop node, uh, I currently have it disabled. You have this option here called use, use, and use. Three different options here. So if I go ahead and click on the use for Z near, it's basically going to take everything from where the camera's at all the way up to 350 and crop it. So if I want to see what that looks like, I can go to my deep to points node here. And you can see what it's doing. It's just chomping away this area here. So again, I'll turn this off and on so you can see what it does. So it's just 350 units from camera. Chomps it off. I can also come over here if I want and take the Z far side and use that. You can see now it's going to chomp 400 pixels back. I can also invert that by saying keep outside range. So you can see back and forth. So again, there's a good little inversion. And finally, you have bounding box operation. So if I put my viewer back to the deep crop node and I use that, you can see I've cropped this information based on an actual bounding box. If I go back to my deep to points data, you can see what it's done. It's kind of chomped that information. Very harsh. That's why a lot of people have created these interesting plugins that actually help kind of transition these harsh kind of uh, cutoffs. And just through the nature of deep, it's not something you can really just add a softening to the edge, at least not at the deep level. That's why most of the stuff in deep eventually moves its way back to 2D. You don't sit in deep for the entire time. Deep is where you sort of build your comp and then eventually you transform it into the two-dimensional workflow. And obviously it ends up in a right node that's a 2D node as well. Okay, so let's talk about deep to image. This one's interesting. So here's a cloud, and we have this deep to image node here. Uh, sorry, deep, yeah, deep to image. And what this does is it basically takes the image and transforms it um, from deep to 2D. So this is the transition node from deep land into 2D land. Now, once you're out of deep, you're no longer underwater. Hence, you are uh, you can't really go back, and you don't have the awesome sort of uh, edge workflows that you would have benefit from actually working in deep. So we're officially out of there and you can see I've just added a grid warp which just fiddles around with it and it has an alpha. So really when you think about deep it's really about how the different elements of CG as well as 2D such as maybe a guy that's on a green screen put on a card put into a cloud field um, how they get all merged together and then once they're merged together then you go in and start you know, putting them onto maybe a background plate or something like that. So, again, the thing with Deep is, for instance, if you were dealing with a bunch of monkeys from Planet of the Apes, and you had two monkeys, like, attacking each other in the foreground, and then you had a monkey w running across the background, and then you finally realize, oh, wouldn't it be nice if that monkey in the background made a leap, all right? And maybe that monkey comes around and walks in front of the two fighting monkeys, well, the good thing about uh, working in deep is you can just render out that individual monkey uh, with the new animation path, and you don't have to worry about any sort of holdout mats that might be an issue. Also, any holdout mats uh, that you would create using cards uh, inside of deep as well, such as a hill that the monkey w went behind and then got in front of and so forth. It really is like sort of a 3D-based compositing. Okay, so for deep from image, so we go from deep to image, going from deep to 2D, and now we're going to go deep from image, in other words, we're going from 2D to deep. So here's a two-dimensional render of, there's no deep data of this cloud, it's just your atypical EXR, and then I use my deep from image, and I have it set to a Z depth of 9, I have it set to specify Z. So what the, what does that mean? Well, it means if I put this to the deep to points view and look at it in three dimensions here, this is now a card. So let's go ahead and just frame that up and take a look. The deep information is not in any volumetric form, but it is now something you can merge into a deep comp with other objects and so forth, which is pretty cool. Um, Again, that's the benefit of using deep. You're used to this sort of carded method in uh, typical compositing, though. So why? Can, how can you use this? Well, imagine this color wheel is actually, say, a person on a green screen. 
maybe a bunch of like army men on green screen and they're in the midst of a battle that's uh, flooded with a bunch of uh, basic dust and debris also fog um, you know and they got gas masks on and they're running around um, you can actually stick these guys on cards and allow the volumetrics that were rendered outside of, uh, in, uh, from Houdini to allow the, the volumetrics to actually go past the actor and as the actor moves towards camera you can animate the Z uh, the, the sort of depths and Z direction of the actual cards and then what you get is a really cool sort of feel for in this case I'll just show you of sticking people into these volumetrics which is really really awesome you really can't do that with a two-dimensional render you can, but the edges can get a little funky. The edges can get a little funky inside here as well, as you can see in this foreground render. It looks pretty good, but we are getting a little bit of areas here that might need to have some softening, uh, a little bit harsh. But again, I can physically take this, this deep from image node, and you can see I can change the depth information of the actual uh, color wheel. So I can move it forward and backwards. So imagine if you had a guy on a green screen, and he was walking towards the screen and you had him emerge from the actual dirt uh, so forth or if you see if I just play this animation um, I should have oops maybe I don't have the animation on here nope this is a, this is a different one but you're getting the idea here you can actually stick a green screen guy in here and you can actually animate with a deep transform node now obviously in the real world when somebody walks through a big cloud like this they're most likely most likely are going to push that cloud of information away from themselves. But say you got a city maybe sitting in a bank far away, and maybe this cloud is really not that, you know, dense. Maybe it's a little bit less dense. If you look at the making of Blade Runner 2049 and the whole special they have about deep compositing with that on YouTube, you'll see the layers these guys are working with are very, very subtle, very, very... <clears throat> faded fog layers that they sort of layered up in the background in the uh, certain sequences. So again, this is a really cool option that you can pull off. Let's move over here to the deep holdout. Now you'll notice I say deep holdout non-soft. This is the atypical node that you'll find under your deep options here for deep holdout, which is right, where's that sucker at? Right over here. So in this case, I'm going to go ahead and show you what I got. I got this uh, roto shape, all right, and I put it to deep from image. And the deep from image, I put it at a distance of 500. And I'll turn on pre-multiply, that way I can see the transparent alpha. If I go to my merge node here, you can see if I turn this off and on, especially when you get to the deep to points uh, data. Go ahead and just zoom out here. You can see that you can turn pre-multiplied on and off. Yeah, you get some kind of weird artifact edge there. Uh, keep zero alpha. We'll just keep the alpha at zero. Uh, you can take a look right here. If I go to the deep holdout now, the holdout has cut out this piece here. It's cut it out rather cleanly, which is really good. The only reality here is to be aware that this is no longer deep at this point. In other words, I can't tape, take a deep merge node and actually merge this on. It's not, it's not deep anymore. It's actually back in 2D land. So again, I could come over here with a color correction node, plug it in, take away the saturation and so forth, you know, do all types of stuff to it. So that's a really cool way of using specific, uh, you know, in this case you can see I'm using this little cutout here uh, in the form of a 2D card to cut out information, which can be helpful. So there's a lot of ways you can use that to cut out information that you want, like in the foreground and behind it and so forth. Again, this is where we get into production workflows. All right, so now we get into these other guys. And again, as I mentioned before, you will not be able to work these unless you actually have these plugins installed. So definitely, like I mentioned before, make sure you get the NU Bridge. It's five bucks a month. If you are serious about compositing, you need to be learning all of the nodes that people use. You can actually go in here and choose by a popularity of downloads, the number of downloads, and see what everybody is using, such as uh, uh, all the Nuke tools and so forth, and JOPS. There's all the plugins, all the scripts. It's all there for you, so you don't have to install it yourself. Um, so anyway. 
let's talk about this right here. So this is a deep crop version that's soft, and the node I'm specifically talk, uh, talking about is deep crop, deep crop soft. Okay, so let me go ahead and just show you. If you just look up the word deep in your keyword search under your NU bridge, you'll find all these plugins. All right, so let's take a look at what we got. So we got uh, this atypical cloud, and we're reformatting it to 1920 by 1080 because it was originally 1280 by 720. And now we're going to take this deep information here. Also, I want you to be aware, too, that you see this little option here for black outside on these deep read nodes? If I turn that off, you might see this streaking effect here, a repeated pixel. Just make sure that you have black outside on when you actually have this on. So just be, be aware of that. So in this case, I've done some transformations where I've just moved these over, did some reformatting. So I've basically taken just two clouds. Another really cool thing you can do here with these deep reformat nodes, I'll put my viewer to this, is you can use the flop. You can flop it. You can turn it 90 degrees. It actually takes 20 years to render. You can see how long it's taking to actually update this and you're like oh my goodness gracious so I'm going to turn that turn off really quick and then of course again you got flip and you got flop right so you can flop it flip it whatever so basically I'm taking this I'm flipping it transforming it over and then I'm moving this one over and now I've created a nice uh, bank of clouds with just two two files and I made them a little bit different so now I have this thing called Deep Crop Soft. Now what is this all about? Let me go ahead and put my viewer to it here. Now the Deep Crop Soft, if you take a look at it, so disable and re-enable it here. Put my viewer here. It basically softens up the the, uh, the files itself. So let me go ahead and just put my put my viewer to the Deep Reformat node. Now what's this Deep Reformat node all about? Um, again, I'm just reformatting this. Let's go ahead and just take a look at the, the final product here. It's going to take forever to render this, unfortunately. Let's go ahead and see if I can find it here. So nothing's turned on yet. That's probably the way nothing's going on. But if I go to my deep crop soft here, you can see that you have this option for Z near and Z far. So I'm going to turn on Z near and you can see what it does. It's just like the crop node that you saw up here. Let's see if we could find a deep crop node. But it's going to give you a harsh reality. So if you come over here, you can see we have this fall off, which helps sort of smooth things out. See how we have that? I can put it to 40. It's sort of like an edge, edge blur, so to speak. So it can give you a nice result. So again, you're not going to be able to see it too much, but if you're trying to transition or cut out something, having this version of the deep crop, where it's a deep crop soft, you can see the difference here. So again, I'll take this deep crop here. And again, you can see there's also a Z near. I can turn that on and turn this one off. And I could put this to like 380 or whatever. So now it's cutting that out. It's cutting that back end out. Uh, you can see you're getting some interesting artifacts right here. And if I take the fallout and put it to 40, it's going to help smooth it out a little bit. You can keep cranking this up and you'll get more of a smoother result. So again, you can see it's sort of like a transitionary fade in here. Let's see if I take this to something nutty like 200 or whatever. And again, you can see the difference. So this is almost like using the old crop node. And let's go ahead and put this back up to 200. So it softens it up just a little bit. You can also soften this type of stuff up by making multiple layers and rendering them out and as little cutouts of layers and actually kind of doing a little bit of edge blur here once you go back into the two-dimensional stage of workflow. Okay, so let's move on. So the deep holdout smoother, this is where it actually softens everything all together. I'm not a big fan of this, but it just seems like it softens everything. Um, so let me just show you what that does. So I have a uh, deep to points here. I have the deep holdout. I'm going to put my viewer to it here. So it, I'm currently, I currently have a regular deep crop on here. So it's cro I've cropped the image uh, accordingly to 529 near. So you can see the difference there. So I've cropped it in, and now I'm using the Smooth tool here to try to smooth out that transition. So you can see what it does. It's almost like smoothing the, the information along the edges here. 
it also seems to be expanding the mat. So you have options here as far as the opacity of this. You can bring it down and basically it's the same thing. If I bring this way up, you're getting sort of like the full uh, workflow. And what's the, it's by default 0.5, almost like you're looking at a half transparency of the actual blur effect. And then the depth offset set to negative one uh, pixel and then you have the depth spread. So the depth spread you can play with as far as how far it's gonna spread out. And then the number of samples, the more samples you have, the better off you'll be, but it'll take very long. This is a very expensive no, and I'm warning you right now. Uh, use it sparingly. Usually it's set to default five samples, so. Okay, so let's talk about Deep From Distance. This is another uh, plugin that you can get. Uh, you can see I'm using this ramp here. Uh, not much to it. And let me go ahead and just show you guys this. The ramp color, if you take a look at the ramp color, I've set this to 61, 61, 61, and then alpha of one. So the values are very high for the ramp itself. And so the transition of the ramp is right here. And then I grade it uh, right here. I think I just have a grade because I was gonna use it and play around with it. And now you can see I have deep from distance. And then I use the deep recolor. So I've recolored it with this image. And I'm going to show you the final results. So I'm going to disable this deep slice, just so you don't see that either. So we're going to show you deep offset and deep slice. These are, again, plugins. So let me just show you what exactly is going on here. So you can see the transition. I've also rotated the camera up a little bit. You can see what's happening here is it's taking this image and using the RGB information to determine the depth of distance here. So you got values that are basically increasing. If I go ahead and take a look here, you see I have this deep to points tool right here. I can also add a, a deep sample node really quick just so you can see what the numbers are reading. So I'll go to deep samples. I'll throw that in right here and take a look. And again, you can see I could just use this little knob right here. You can see in this case, because this is a two-dimensional element brought in, you're only getting a deep front and a deep back, and they're reading the exact same numbers here. But you can see the distances here. So down here, you're getting distances of like six units, and then you're getting up here to 60 units, and stays, stays consistent to about 61 units from here and above. Again, it's almost like depth distance when it comes to it. Very similar in sort of the the way it works, but it's just a lot more information going on. It's sort of like the depth pass on steroids when you talk about deep. Okay, so if I go back here again, you can see what it's doing. You're looking at the field of view of the camera here. You can see the field of view of the camera uh, and just the, the workflow here. The, the millimeter lens does play a part. You gotta always make sure that it matches according to what you had in Maya or Houdini. All right, so the uh, deep offset if I go ahead and turn that off, I'll turn that off and on, you can see what it's doing. It's basically offsetting everything, specific units, very similar to what you would see inside the deep transformation. And then we have this deep splice tool here. And I'll turn that on. And I turn this guy off, turn the deep offset on. And you can see what it's doing. It's basically splicing from a specific distance here. So if I take a look at the deep slice again, this is a plug-in. You got near plane set to 23. I can dial that down a little bit more. And you'll see it's going to take a little bit of time to calculate. Let's see if I can cut this to 11 maybe. See how it's cutting it off. And then you got the plane thickness, which actually has to do with the thickness of the plane. All right, so Z to deep. Now, why I actually found Z to deep is one of the most popular downloads. This one isn't really good because you would probably at this point need a, a deep recolor node or something. Uh, you know, for instance, it needs a deep recolor node after the deep from distance. And Z to deep kind of does everything for you together. So here I made a 3D scene with a cube inside of Nuke, a typical 3D. I've rendered out Scanline. Scanline is actually reading depth information. So if I put my viewer to it, put my viewer to it, go back, you can see here's my RGB information and there's my depth information, right? So Scanline render exports that stuff. So what I've done is I've shuffled the depth information from the 3D render. And then 
that's my depth, and the color information is coming from my scanline render using this Z to deep. Again, this is a plugin. And the Z to deep, I have currently have this uh, pretty much where it's at. If I take a look at it, let's go ahead. I'll go to, uh, I have the Z to deep, and I go to the combine. I did an offset transformation of this one. And then I merge them two together. So now if you go to deep to points, you can see what we have here. We have basically some... Uh, that we have information that's using the Z information. So if you had any objects that you rendered inside of Maya and you just had Z depth information, uh, you can actually bring them in here and use them and get them into the Z depth world. So it's a great transitionary period if you don't have an actual pass. Uh, the edge workflow won't be as robust as just using pure deep in all aspects. But by taking something and transforming it into Z, uh, Z land, or uh, I'm sorry, deep land, um, you can stick that thing into different places. It's limited, obviously. Um, your volumetrics uh, that were rendered out and gone through this process will not look like this. Uh, they'll, they'll have just basically one depth distance. You can see that with these cubes. It only goes so far. There's no volumetric uh, backside or behind the scenes type stuff in here, especially if you're using volumetrics for this tool. And that's pretty much for Z, Z to, to deep. And again, there's not much information here. Uh, you can specify Z, if Z, uh, Z depth. If you want to just use the Z depth they have in there, or you can define the Z depth itself by increasing this number. In this case, we'll go to 300 units. And it's way back there now. So I can put this to 200. So you have that choice, or you're just basically reading the Z depth according to what it's being read out of the scanline render. So in this case, if I turn that off, it's just reading the scanline render information. All right, we're almost almost to the end here. Uh, deep copy B box. What is this? It's real simple. This has a B box. We're going to use that for the the bounding box information. Here's the other read. By doing this, my bounding box is set to the input for bounding box. Real brain surgery there. Okay, so deep key mix. A lot of people have been asking about using a deep key mix. Uh, you can actually use a roto mask to cut into this. If you take a look at it. You know how the deep key mix works. You have an A input, you have a B input, and what you get is see if I can get this going here. Da, 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 da. So if you can come back up here, you can see what's happening here. It's kind of chomping into these two at two different distances like that, and it's mixing the two in. You can see what it looks like. Now, the only bad thing about this is you would assume, like, oh, well, I'll just blur the roto, right? So here's my roto edge. Notice I've actually gotten RGB information being pumped out of this uh, right here, and the current color of this Bezier is a slight gray. Uh, or like a dark gray, but the alpha is set to 100%. So I'm imparting, I'm basically exporting RGB and alpha information from this. And if I put this through to the deep node, um, it's currently using the alpha information. If I use the luma information of the RGB, you can see I'm getting a half transparency option here based on the luma information of the road or the RGB information. If I switch to alpha, it's using the alpha information. And if I try to blur the roto node to have a nice, awesome transition between the two, um, you're getting this interesting artifact right here, uh, which is pretty interesting. Um, I'm not sure if there's something that I might might be causing that. Um, you know, you might play around with unpremo, but I don't believe it's possible to even do this. You know, I mean, I don't know if it's like a just playing around here. It's like a pre-malt or nothing. Yeah, you're not getting... You ain't getting your cake and eating it too, unfortunately. Um, maybe there's a way around that. If there is, you please tell me, folks. I'm just winging it. So here's the deep key mix. Again, the B input and whatever is an A is what will be exposed by the alpha. Let me disable that blur node so you can see it. Deep constant. Well, this isn't brain surgery either. Um, I took a deep constant, put a value of 1 for red, 0 for blue and green, and alpha at 100%. Put it through to take a look at it. Wow, look at that. It's a card in space with a solid color. And then, of course, you can change the depth information. Uh, if you want to put this somewhere around 400 units or 300 units, you can shrink it down. So you can have something in the background that's a deep color or just a deep constant. 
Okay, so PG Boca with Deep. Now again, PG Boca um, is something that I believe it's like fifty dollars a month or something. Um, I forgot what the total amount was, or if it's like I think it's fifty dollars a year. I could be wrong about that, but uh, double check. So with that, you get PG Boca, which is the industry standard, um, uh, basically depth of field. So if you think by using such tools as a ZD Focus Node, uh, your your Rockstar. No, this is what they use on the Lego movies. This is what they use. Every single studio uses PG Boca. Um, and in this case, uh, for some reason, my version is weird. I'm getting the watermark. I'm still trying to figure out. Where I'm having a problem talking back and forth with the guys over there to figure out why um, my registration isn't working uh, for my PG Boca. Uh, so the folks there at uh, Pelegrin Labs are great. Check them out. Uh, it should definitely be something that you want to learn on here. I'm going to do a whole tutorial on PG Boca in the future in regards to all of its aspects. It works both with deep and with Z-depth data. In this case, I want to show you a very rough introduction with watermarked version using the deep data. So here you can see I have the deep cloud information. I'm going to plug that into the deep input. I have the camera information, and then I have the input to the actual color information. So I'm going to go ahead and put my viewer to it. So uh, when this input is not uh, plugged in, okay, you're going to have different options. So if this is plugged in, it's going to know that you're using deep. And also if you have a camera plugged in, it's going to read the camera information itself. So under camera, you can see here you have the focal length set and all this, but you also have the f-stop. And again, the lower the number, the more shallow depth of field or very limited range that's in focus. So like if you're looking at an ant in macro photography, you put this up to something like 16 f-stop. It's like being outside on a big, broad, blasting day. You've stopped your uh, aperture down, and hence everything's going to be in focus. And the focus distance is based on this little cross here, so you can actually change this. In this case, I have it set to 420, but you can see I can change it by changing the actual distance. And that's going to choose what's in focus. The beauty of PG Bokeh is that it actually, you can actually set this to use real-world lenses. And you can actually set it to whatever lens you currently have. So if you're dealing with a four-thirds lens, like a you know, Blackmagic uh, Pocket 4K camera, you can plug that in. Um, you can set your width and height, the aperture length, and all this stuff. You can see you can turn this off. And it's going to be using the real-world lens simulation here. It's going to be reading off the actual camera itself. Uh, you can also plug in the actual shape of the actual bokeh. Um, but again, I have another tutorial for that coming up. So in this case, uh, you have something very similar to the options that you would see in a Z defocus. You have the defocus image, lens. Usually you want to jump over to this focus distance uh, visualization. Let me just go ahead and show you what this looks like. Go back to 2D land here. And if you switch this to your focus distance visualization, this works a little bit differently than the way that you would see a Z defocus. Anything in red is what's going to be in focus or your uh, depth of field. Anything in blue, I believe, is your foreground out of focus, and your green is your background out of focus, or vice versa. Um, anyway, so you can see in this case, it's reading off of the distance of the camera. So the camera itself is what you have to do to choose what's in focus in this case. So you can see if I take the f-stops and start to bring this up even higher, so say maybe if I put this up to a 5.6 f-stop, you're going to get more things in focus, uh, and that's the red. So... I'm going to leave this at a 1.4. Okay, so I'm really just focusing on this foreground cloud here. And that's where my marker, my, my cross here, is actually set to. So again, you can see if I take a look here and put my viewer in, you can see my cross here is right there. And I'm focusing just on this front piece of the cloud here, which is really awesome. So now by lowering this information in regards to the camera's f-stop, things are going to get more and more shallow very quickly or go out of focus very quickly uh, in the clouds. Let me just go ahead and put this back to 2D mode. And now we're going to pop out of this mode where we actually see things. Again, I'm not using my z-depth information here. I'm actually using the camera's 3D position work, which is the best work. And you're going to get the best 
depth of field, bokeh, and less artifacts using this deep workflow, by the way. All right, so going back here, uh, I'm going to switch this from focal distance visualization to the final result, which is defocused image. Again, I'm getting the artifact from, from here, but if you kind of take a look, you have a dis disable and re-enable here. You can see that the clouds are going out of focus. But if I go to the foreground here, you can see this foreground cloud lump is staying in focus. So really cool, really, really cool. And again, you can emphasize the multiplier on this. The multiplier will multiply depth of field, then the front multiplier will intensify the, the depth of field, the contrast of uh, going in out of focus faster by multiplying the front out of focus and then the back out of focus. So in this case, we could take the, the uh, back multiplier and increase that pretty dramatically here and give it a second to render. And you can see what's happening there by multiplying the back multiplier or what's behind of what's in focus, you can see it's dramatically going out of focus a lot faster. These samples are really good. They're the best that you can really get in regards to um, out of focus uh, tool sets. That's why you can see it in the Lego movie and all these awesome movies. Uh, what should eventually happen here is this cloud right here should stay uh, in focus. Uh, as we kind of, it's going to be a harsh transition. So if you're trying to do the simulation of, say, an ant, uh, that is, uh, you know, and the beauty of this whole thing is, if you track a 3D camera and you bring it into this scene, and you have the millimeter lens, and you have all this information in the physical camera itself, and you're just taking that cross here and doing rack focus, and actually telling the computer what your uh, actual crop sensor is and so forth. Is it 35 millimeters? Is it micro four thirds? You're going to get the most accurate representation and fall off of proper depth of field that you would commonly get in the real world. So it's not just some kind of hack job using the Z-depth pass that you would use with the ZD focus node. Okay, so again, you can see it's looking good. I'm going to disable this because it's taking 20 years here. So I'm going to take that and plug it off so you can see see the difference uh, quite a quite a difference I could take this down a little bit and then you got your front which if anything was out of focus in front you can actually do that uh, for what it is you could also choose a focal region fall off from linear and then your focus region size to 22 uh, so a lot of this stuff I'm gonna go and demo in the future just to let you guys uh, get involved so again I thank you guys for this demonstration um, I would like to say, again, please support my Patreon so that I can do more training and I can spend more time instead of working freelance and teaching, uh, getting uh, a chance to teach. I, I, like I said, I am not a super rock star. Um, I had one of the best compositors in the industry told me to, f uh, he said to me, you know, fake it till you make it. Um, I can tell you my gift is teaching. Uh, that's just what it is. And I want to learn more about these techniques and be able to teach them in layman's terms to you guys. That's a gift I think I have above more compositors. Compositors are, you know, rock stars. Uh, but I think my own personal rock starism, I'm not patting myself on the back, but I'm saying my gift is uh, teaching. And although I won't get into the spotlight, as most of you compositors will on big, big rock star motion pictures, um, I really believe I can be a service unto you guys by teaching you in layman's terms these really awesome techniques and these advanced tool sets. So again, please support me. Check out my website. Check out my training. And I will see you guys uh, in part two eventually where we start to getting into applying all of this uh, into deep.